Okay, good morning. How's everybody doing? Okay, it is such an honor to be with you all today. Hey, if we've not met, my name is Hunter Melton, and I'm the campus and teaching pastor here at the church at Woodbine. And if you are a guest with us today, man, it is our honor that you are here. Like, we are grateful for you, and we are hopeful for what the gospel can do in your life. If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to open them up or turn them on uh, to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And remember, using the table of contents for the minor prophets is never a bad thing, okay? So let's open them up to Joel chapter 2. As you're turning there, I want to tell you a story about home ownership. Anybody here ever feel like home ownership sometimes is more headache than it's worth, right? Okay, I'll tell you a story about that for me. Um, we had our child, our second child, in December of 2022, and uh, we, we loved her, or so grateful for her, and I would have to get up in the middle of the night to uh, sometimes to help feed uh, her with a bottle, and so uh, I remember one night, it was April of 2023, I was uh, woken up by her crying, and so I was like, I know what I need to do, get the bottle ready, and I go downstairs to kind of prepare everything, because our bedrooms are upstairs, and um, what I noticed was, was there was a hissing sound coming out of the closet where our hot water heater was. Yeah, now everybody had like a proverbial grass, like just go ahead and knock the wood on the pews, that's never gonna happen to you, okay? And I should have known something was wrong because the night before, I got a text message from Metro Water Services saying that our bill was $150. And I was like, okay, I don't know if that's explainable totally, but I'm just gonna ignore it. Four o'clock in the morning, hissing water coming out of the closet where a hot water heater is, you know, probably not good, but I'm just going to ignore it. And I went back to bed. Yeah, this is just, if you're losing respect for me, I get it. I get it. <laughs> and so I, I went up to bed and I woke up in the morning. And I said, uh, I said, babe, I said, there's, there's this hissing sound coming from where our, or the closet where our hot water heater is. But I looked inside and I don't see any like water spewing out anywhere. She's like, oh, it's weird. So I called a plumber. And this, you know, this boy showed up on a Saturday morning and, and you know, probably didn't want to like do a full, uh, full effort in the repair job. And he looks underneath our house and sure enough, there's like steam coming out of our crawl space uh, where the water, hot water heater is just, it's just leaking water into the crawl space. And he goes, hey man, you know, like can't fix it today. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, I said, should we turn the water off? He goes, eh, you should be good. And I was like, I don't know, I'm not like a professional, but that doesn't seem like a good thing. And he goes, ah, you're all right. So that's a Saturday, they can't get out till Monday to repair it. So I had a whole like 48 hours to just really marinate around like, do I cut the water off for our family, leaving us without water, or do I just let this hissing sound continue to come? And I'd ask other people and they were like, you know, I don't know, it's just in your crawl space, you should be all right. And I was like, gosh, that seems weird. And we debated whether we should turn the water off or not. Finally, Monday morning rolls around. I quickly learned thousands of dollars later and months of repairs later, it is not okay to let water run into your crawl space, right? And I, the guy was like, this is a travesty. This is bad. It took months. We had to move out of our house for a week. They had, it took from, that was in April. We didn't finish up the repair until July. Hey, you know what? You might've come to church to hear this today. If you hear water running in your house, Turn the water off, okay? That's just, that's for free right there. And I remember thinking to myself, why did nobody tell me? Like, why I asked a bunch of people, I called the professional, why did nobody tell me? You know, and it's crazy because if somebody had told me, I would have been able to save at least some, I mean, it inconvenienced, but I would have been able to save a lot of headache, a lot of heartache. Um, now, that, that's one small incident, but I want to give you like maybe a more serious uh, thing that's actually more serious than a pipe leaking in your wall. Our world today is made up of 17,528 people groups. Now, there's a lot of people here who know what people groups are even more than I do, but how you define a people group is basically around an understanding of common language, right? How quickly could the gospel move from people to people? That's a people group. So they normally like understand, like common language is a people group. Now, of those 17,528 people groups that make up the 7 billion people here on earth, 7,217 of them are considered unreached people groups or least reached. And that means that there are less than 2% of people in that people group who know the Lord. And that means there is no active gospel work happening in their midst. 
And you might be here today and you might have come from an unreached people group. And what I would say is this, is of those 7,217 people groups that are unreached, do you know how many people that represents? 3.4 billion people who are not anticipating Jesus' second return because they have not heard of Jesus' first coming. Now, here's the deal. In the same way, somebody needed to tell me to turn off the water in my house. Somebody needs to tell them. And Richard is right. Like, Nashville is a growing international city that is, the world is coming here, and we might not be able to get to where they are coming from, but they will go back at some point, right? Or they will be here, and they will be amongst people from their people group. And my heart is this, is that our church, it might be said that the gospel would go like a lightning bolt, like a flaming arrow into the darkness of this world, even from here at 29 Whitsey Road. Why? Because your entire life and my entire life is defined by how we relate to Jesus, either as children of God or, as we said last week, enemies of God. And there are people who do not know that. And a lack of knowledge is not a lack of guilt, or a lack of knowledge is not a lack of accountability. And that is why it is incumbent upon us to run to those who do not know because someone brought it to you. Someone told you. Are we going to be people of the word, for the word, by the word, for eternity? So today, in Joel 2, we're going to read a pretty dark, yet redeeming passage. Uh, if you are able, I'm going to ask you to stand this morning in the honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to read the first verse together, and then in the rest of the sermon, we are going to be all over the second chapter. So Joel 2, verse 1. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. Tell all of your people. Get your loudest megaphone because the day of the Lord is coming. Not only is it coming, it's near. Let's pray because we need Jesus this morning. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp into our feet and it is a light into our path. But most importantly, your word reveals your character. It reveals your heart for us, but it also reveals your heart for your justice. And so, Jesus, may it be said of us that you have found the church at Woodbine in August of 2024, a people who are not only wanting to have our heads educated, but our lives mobilized. Because we refuse to be defined by the American dream of 40 hours a week with two weeks of vacation all the way up into retirement, and then we go home to be with you. Like, no, we are people who are different. So let us be ones who submit our lives to your word to go share the word so that the world might know that you are coming. We love you, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. Keep your Bibles open, please, to the second chapter of Joel because we are going to be jumping around all in that chapter. Okay, Joel 2. If you're taking notes, these first 11 verses, I just say is this. I would summarize it in this way. The day of the Lord is coming. Okay, the Lord is coming soon. Do we believe it? Right, it, it, it's not just a passive spectator, but an active participant here. Do we believe that Jesus is coming back for his people? But I want to ask a question. How much do you believe it? How strong is your belief? Is it an unshakable belief? The Lord will one day come back for his people. Do we believe it? The Lord will one day sound the trumpet of judgment and every person that you know and that I know will bow the knee to Jesus. Are we confident of that? Right? And if not, 
Okay, let's just, clarity is kindness. If not, why? Right? And my question for us is this, is if we were fully convinced that Jesus could come back at any point, how would that change the way that we live our lives now? Joy and I were in, uh, we went to a, like a little staycation this past weekend, and she is so good to lead a, a, a conversation sometimes and said, you know, Hunter, there are people on our street that we have never like had up into our home or invited them to church or to have a gospel conversation with. Like, is that the same for us, for you? Right? This first verse, blow the ram's horn. This isn't a quiet action, right? This isn't something that you're like, hey, you know what? My ram's horn, it's personal. You know what? Well, we're not going to talk about it. Mom told me to never talk about religion in public. So I'm just not, I'm going to blow the ram's horn quietly on my own kind of level, right? No, this is blow the ram's horn. The ram's horn, crazy, biblically is used for two reasons. Number one, it was used to call uh, up the army for war. If you were a soldier and you heard the ram's horn, it wasn't like they were walkie-talkie in back in that day, emailing each other, all right, guys, time to mobilize. They blew the ram's horn, and if you were a soldier, you know it was time to go. But also, the ram's horn was used to call people to worship. So war or worship, in the same way, our words of gospel hope, Jesus saves, our refrain forever, are meant to be war against the flesh and a call up to deep worship of God our Savior where salvation alone is found. Do you see that we are declaring war against the prince and principalities of this world with our words and we are calling people up to worship? We don't just call them to abstain from things, but we call them to something, the praise and admonition of God himself. Blow the ram's horn. I almost brought a shofar, but I thought that would be a little scary. You know what I mean? I thought it'd be, it just got a little too uh, you know, crazy, so I didn't. But look with me uh, in, these, in this chapter at how the day of the Lord is described for those who do not know the Lord. Okay, verse two, it's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness. Verse six, nations writhe in horror, all faces turn pale. Verse 10, the earth quakes before them, the sky shakes, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars cease their shining. Verse 11, indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible, and it's dreadful. Who can endure it? Now, if all this sounds apocalyptic, you're like, whoa, I thought we were in Joel, not the book of Revelation. Come on, Hunter. It's because Joel was the one who coined the term, the day of the Lord. And when we say that, what he's saying there is this, is there is a day that Jesus will come back to make the right things or make the wrong things right. That's the day of the Lord. That final judgment when Jesus comes, Revelation talks about it. That is yet to come. Joel is joining in the chorus that says, hey, look, there is a savior who will come and he will do a final judgment, right? So that's in Revelation. It says, look, the day of the Lord, right? Jesus' return is coming soon. So my question for us right now, because good preaching, what we're doing here today is not just meant to hit our heads. It's meant to stir our hearts to do something different. So my question for you is how are you using your moments between the time that you put your trust in Jesus and the time that he will return? Is your life weird or odd in the eyes of the world, or are we just a little bit busier on a Sunday morning? Because faith doesn't, it's not opposed to, to, to effort, or grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning, which means this, a vibrant faith that is lived out will always be demonstrated with our actions, mainly in this way. You've heard St. Francis of Assisi. He says, uh, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Friends, it is always necessary to use words. Why? Because the gospel is a specific gospel. The path of Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Not a way, a truth, a life. He is the truth. And that article is so important. Why? Because people need to hear that there is many uh, other areas where we might try to find firm footing, but there's only one in Jesus. But I have to ask this. 
If we're not fully convinced of that, I don't know if we will mobilize to tell others about it. How are you using your moments between now and then? I love C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples, if you ever wanted to know what his initials stood for. Clive Staples Lewis. Hey, that man made a difference in this world, and his parents named him Clive Staples Lewis. You can do anything, all right? Here's his quote. He says this, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Christian, how much do you think about the fact that one day your eternal home is not here? It's not in the ground. It is with King Jesus. And if you are here and you do not know Jesus, I want to say the day of salvation is not only near, it can be today. Like you can find this hope where you do not have to fear the day of the Lord. You can welcome it with worship because you know that you're about to receive your reward, which is a life eternity lived with our King Jesus. But I have to ask those who know Jesus now, does your life indicate that you believe that the Lord is coming back? And I'm asking myself that. Like, I want to know for myself, like, how would my life be different if I thought Jesus were coming back tomorrow? Not just to bring his children home, but for final judgment against those who have turned their nose up at the Lord. But they can, everybody can get, the ground is even at the foot of the cross. Jesus saves sinners to the utmost, right? We have a message to tell, a gospel to display with our lives. Romans 10, 15 says this, How then can they call on him that they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? That word preacher is not the office of pastor, it's the proclaimer, right? How can they hear without a proclaimer? And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Friends, the day of the Lord is near. Are you telling? And the day of the Lord is near. Are you repenting? Look with me, if you will, at verses 12 through 13 in Joel 2, if you'll look with me there. Joel, later on in his chapter, he says, even now, even now, I was in the life group this morning with Mary and Richard Barnes, and we talked about those two words being so powerful. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all of your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. Like, don't just proclaim things outwardly because you know that's what to do, but get it inwardly. And return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Let's go ahead and read verse 14. Who knows? Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer a grain offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Hey, friends, good news here for us today. If we call upon the Lord out of a right heart, meaning that we're we're not just trying to get out of the consequences, but we're trying to get closer to the Lord and we know that our sin blocks us from intimacy with God. If we call upon him, then he is faithful and just to forgive. If we repent... Now, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry for blowing it for the 5,000th time. Repentance is literally saying, Lord, I'm going down this direction, and now I am turning and I'm going your direction, which means you will blow it. Like the Christian life is one of continual repentance. But for a Christ follower, Sin patterns are convictions that we are not serious about how the gospel has invaded our lives. But salvation can't be just outward, right? We can't just gather here on Sunday mornings. We we can't just go through the motions. It needs to be a broken and contrite heart. David blew it with Bathsheba, had her husband killed. I mean, things that, like, I would never let that dude inside the doors of this church, knowing his background, right? Because he's just the danger to all of us. But what did he do that God said he was a man after my own heart? He came back to the Lord 
And he said, you don't want bulls on an altar. Like, you don't want me going through the motions. What you desire is a broken and contrite heart. Another one of the ways you want to know if you are in line with Jesus, how is your brokenness over your sin? Do you manage your sin or do you kill your sin? Right? Uh, My lawn is a lot of just weeds. And you know how I manage the weeds? I just mow them. But do you know how I would want to rid the lawn of the weeds? I would kill them, right? Be killing your sin or your sin will be killing you. Verse 13, though, says this. He is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He abounds in faithful love. And he relents from sending disaster. The Lord desires to forgive you and to forgive me. Why? Because he wants relationship with you and with me. The Lord desires to forgive out of the abundance of his kindness. You know what this means for for us? God isn't the DMV worker who just accepts the fact that we exist and we showed up. He's not just taking your number because you showed up. He wants to walk with you and to desire restoration with you. And he does this through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Romans 6, 23, look with me on the screen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so verse 14 says, who knows? The the author is just saying like, hey, things are really bad. But maybe if we turn to the Lord, and he's saying this like, we know God's character is the same, so he will. So when he's asking that, he's just prompting the, the listener or the reader just to reflect. But he's saying, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Do you see? When he says this, so you can offer a grain offering and a drink offering to who? The Lord your God. The blessing is new life where we can find peace, purpose, hope, and unity with God here and now. And that blessing is offered through the Lord and is available to all people. And that blessing doesn't just terminate on us, right? The Lord's not just heaping blessings upon you because you are his favored child. He's heaping blessings upon you, and anything that you have in this life that is good is from the Lord. God is the author of all good and perfect gifts. But what are you doing, right? Look what that author, look what Joel says there, that he gives us those gifts so that we might turn around and offer unto the Lord offerings. So we reflect back to God his goodness that he has given to you. My question is this, what are you doing with God's blessings in your life? Like, how are you determining that God has blessed you, therefore I will bless other people? God's blessings came to you because they were on their way to someone else. Verse 17, look with me. We're going to be done here in just a minute. But verse 17, look with me. Let the priest, the priests back then were not good people. They were, had fallen away. The, The tribe of Levi had fallen away. And he's saying, let the priest, the Lord's ministers. Hey, friends. Do you know why God is so after the church to divide the church? Do you know why so many ministers, it seems like, fall from grace, have moral failures? It's because Satan is after division, and the number way he does that, number way, one way he does that is by messing with the church. And if you can mess with the pastor, you can mess with the church. If you mess with the church, then all of a sudden you start losing the stability of the gospel. And so here's what he says. Let the priests, let the Lord's ministers weep between the portico and the altar. This is what they were supposed to be doing. When they would come out to meet the people, there was only a place that the people could come, right? In the altar, you couldn't, if you weren't a minister, you couldn't go beyond the portico. So the priest would come out to meet them and they would receive their offerings. And this is what God is saying. As they turned around and started walking towards the altar to offer the sacrifice of the people, the priest was supposed to be weeping for the people. Like the priest was supposed to be saying, God, these people, their hearts are not ready. Their lives are not ready. And it is up to me to call out for them on their behalf so that they might come back to you. 
Now, what does that mean here? It means that our staff's greatest thing that we can do for you is to pray on your behalf. Not because you need a pastor or a minister to get to God, but because we are called here to brag for and to plead for and to set up for your flourishing spiritually. What, is it, what are they supposed to say? Have pity on your people, Lord. And do not make your inheritance a disgrace, an object of scorn among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Like the priests were supposed to be the ones pleading with Jesus, come back, come back to your people. So, hey, this is a personal thing. Will you do me a favor? Would you allow for us to pray for you? Like, would you let us know how we can call out for you, not because you need a priest, like I said, or a pastor or a minister or anybody like that to get between you and God as like a medium or like a, a vessel, but because it is our honor to be here weekly, daily, and we could think of nothing better than to call out on your behalf as ministers to serve you and to love you as you respond to God's grace in your life. I want to say this pastorally, uh, verse 25, if you'll look at it with me. I love this verse. It just says this, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts ate. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts ate. Okay, why is that so big? These locusts came in and destroyed crops, crops that these people have been working on for years and years and years. And I want to say this for you who are here today. You might feel that whatever that swarming locust is, that there have been years that have been taken from you. That you might feel like that there has been uh, blow after blow, hit after hit, and it doesn't seem like we know how things will be redeemed or how things will be restored. You might be like four weeks turned into four months, turned into four years, turned into four decades, and now what do I have? And the Lord will repay for you the years that the swarming oak locusts have eaten, which means this, that God knows how to redeem. God knows how to pull back. God knows how to bring to you blessings upon blessings, not even financially, right? Like that's not the, if that was all that we were doing is financial, then God is just a proverbial banker, but he knows how to redeem and restore for you the years that you think are lost and you might as well just throw them away. He says, I can redeem and reuse and restore and renew every single one of them. God is that good. He's that kind. Friends, the Lord redeems. The Lord restores, the Lord sees, the Lord knows. But until we get to heaven, life will continue to be what it is, which is infected with the sin where people look out for number one and they don't turn and they don't, they don't consider other people and, and think bad things happen. But until we get to heaven, may the hope of our future home impact the way that we live here in our current home. Which leads me to my final point. If you'll look with me at verses 28 through 32. God says, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. I love that in verse 28, that the day of the Lord has come in some ways at Pentecost. In Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out upon people. And so Jesus' death and resurrection not only tore the veil, there was no more divide between the portico and the altar, but he tore the veil on the cross, unleashing the Holy Spirit on God's people. You see, the center of the Lord's presence is no longer this house, meaning you do not have to come here to experience God. Where is the center of the Lord's presence? It's you, Right? If you all hear bodybuilders and people who take care of themselves being like, I got to do this because my body is a temple, okay? It's not meaning that like you shouldn't eat like a, a large cheese pizza or, or you shouldn't eat a large cheese pizza, but that's not what that verse is getting at, right? 
What that's getting at is that now the temple that used to be geographically in Jerusalem, the spirit of God is being democratized, meaning it's being sent out and given to the people inside of you and me, meaning that you are the center of God's plan for this world to bring people back unto him. We don't have to make a pilgrimage anymore to Jerusalem to find the presence of God because you are here. Right? You don't have to wait to heaven to have a full and abundant life. But God's presence isn't meant to come to you to stay with you. Your salvation might be personal, but it is never private. God's spirit is poured out on all of his people so that his people might show other people how good our God is. So, uh, band, I'm going to have you guys come back up. My question for you is this. Um, the day of the Lord is coming soon. Are you telling? The day of the Lord is coming soon. Are you repenting? The day of the Lord is coming soon. Are you ready? The day of the Lord is coming soon. Are the people in your life, my life, are they ready? Because there's a message that we are called to tell and I want to read this again. Richard read this earlier from Revelation 7. And I, can, I love Richard Barnes so much. His heart and mine are aligned in so many ways. Um, but Revelation 7, 9 through, 9 through 12. I just want to read this. And I want to ask you to do this. Because nobody's going to steal your phone or your purse or, or anything like that. Just If you would close your eyes. Sometimes scripture is boring because we don't allow it to be real to us. We don't allow it to, to get imaginative. So would you close your eyes and would you, would you just bow your heads just, and just listen to these words? If you're a believer in this, in, in God, in Jesus, then you're in this passage. John was seeing you. He was seeing me. And this is what he says. After this, I looked. And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. You don't lose your ethnicity in heaven. Isn't that cool? There was standing there, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice. Can you hear it? Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down on the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, help us. Help us in our unbelief to see your face. Help us when we believe yet don't believe to proclaim your goodness in the land of the living as long as it can be called the living. And help us to be bold warriors sent out from here, not to congregate here because it feels like home, but we congregate here to get our marching orders and to go, to get uh, battle buddies, to lock arms with one another, and then to run the race because the day of the Lord is near. And if the nations are in Nashville, then let us not be people who went to heaven wishing we could have gotten more people to heaven. Let us share our faith because you are real. Let us live our faith because you are good. And let us proclaim our faith because you are coming. Amen and amen. Um, band, I'm going to get off the stage real quick. And I can't think of anything better than to sing worship to Jesus. So would you all lead us this morning?